Grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Last push of summer, right? As we head into autumn, beautiful weekend. And so we're grateful to God for it. Um, Two quick announcements or things for us to do, and then a couple changes in the order of worship, and then we're off and sailing. So I'm going to invite the ushers, if you'd bring these red books down for us now and just invite people. This is not mandatory. You don't have to do this, but we invite people to let us know you're here. And if you want more information about our church, this is a a way for us to be in touch with you. Also, in the pews, there are these blue cards, prayer cards. We invite you to jot down if there is something or someone for which you would like us to be in prayer. You can do that right now. Um, And we will collect them shortly and include those prayer concerns in our service later on. The two changes, Um, the opening hymn is not that. It's number 116. Words will be on the screen, but it's also in the red hymnal, uh, The God of Abraham Praise, number 116. And, oh, I guess that was the only, oh, yes. And the other change is, um, and we'll remind you of this at the end, the closing hymn, Stand By Me. We're not going to repeat the same two verses we sang at the offertory. We're going to sing the rest of the hymn. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll. Cue you in when we get there, okay? This morning we start a 12 week um, series walking through the Bible. And so we begin with Genesis. If all goes well, we will end with Revelation uh, 12 Sundays from now. And we're going to be talking today about a particular character. In fact, perhaps the first real character in the Bible that we can begin to relate to. Uh, His name was Abram which means uh, father of the exalted or exalted father. And you know, his name gets changed as is uh, often the case in scripture where people's names are changed to reflect a new relationship with God or to say something about their own calling. Abram's name will be changed to Abraham, uh, which has a slightly different meaning. Now he's not uh, the exalted father, but he is the father of the nations or father of the multitude. And so our opening hymn is number 116, and the name of it is The God of Abraham Praise. I'll play an introduction and then invite you to stand, and we will sing and worship together. Number 116.
Good morning. We will be reading the psalm prayer, 71, Psalm 71, verses 1 through 12. It's on page 794 in the red hymnal, or the words will be found on the screen. I'll read the light print, and uh, you'll join me in reading the bold print. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been an example to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent, for my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is no deliverer. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Now we're going to revisit my childhood. When I was a little boy, there was a program on in the afternoon for 15 minutes, and I don't remember the name of the program. I remember it was sponsored by Fryhoffers. I can still sing the jingle if you'd like, but maybe another time. And one of the pieces of this program was an opportunity for children to make a picture and this artist, whose name I remember, his name was Jim. They called him Uncle Jim Fisk. His job was to take whatever the, the child did and make something out of it. So in the program, Uncle Jim would ask the children, and there would be a bleacher of children, three, four, five, six years old around there. He would ask the question, who wants to squiggle. Um, can we be ready to run the video? Okay. Now who's gonna make a squiggle for me? Boy, I'm really glad I didn't sing it, Adam. Adam told me, he says, I have a surprise for you in the um, opening video for the children's message. That was it. There was Uncle Jim Fisk on YouTube. Wow. I could have sung that jingle. Maybe even better than that, but... Okay, so Uncle Jim asks, who wants to squiggle? And most of the time, that's what would happen. The kid would just... Just scribble all over the piece of paper. Now, Uncle Jim would have to go up to this and make a picture, make something nice out of it. Every now and then, however, this would happen. Every now and then, 
one of the children would draw something that you could recognize. A tree, a house, a car, a boat. And Uncle Jim would have to make something out of this picture. Now let's look at the two of them side by side. We have the squiggle on your left, my right, and we have the tree on your right. If you were Uncle Jim and you had to make a picture, something recognizable and fun that the child would want to take home, how many of you would want to start with the squiggle on your left? How many of you would want the squiggle? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About seven or eight of you, okay. How many of you would want the tree? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Many more hands are going up, okay. Why, for those of you who wanted the squiggle, why would you want the squiggle? Okay, June, when she sees the squiggle, she sees the manger with the baby in it and the sun shining around it. In a very abstract way, I suppose, I was going to say, what did you have for breakfast? But no, I... I, get, I see it. Does everybody see that? Yeah. Those of you who picked the tree, why would you pick the tree? Why would you pick the tree? A recognizable starting point. Okay. If you were the artist, what might you add to the tree? More trees. <laughs> okay. Now there's another option. Let's look at the other option. What if Uncle Jim said, who wants to squiggle, and a child just handed him back the sheet of paper, or in this case, the whiteboard, so that Uncle Jim could draw whatever he wanted Now, the reason I'm showing this to you is because we're talking about Abraham today, and I want the children, to, uh, say the word Abraham, say that, Abraham, say it again, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham is like this. Abraham steps into the Bible, and we know very little about him. And we're going to talk about that in a little while, how important that was for how he lived his life. Abraham was not known as a man who had a lot of plans. We don't remember Abraham because Abraham was organized. We don't think of Abraham as someone who knew exactly what he was going to do next. There's one word that we associate with Abraham. Not only was he the exalted father, Abram, not only the father of multitudes or nations, Abraham, but he's also known as the father of what? Faith. He had faith. Abraham had faith, says the Bible, and God counted that to him as righteousness. Abraham steps into the Bible without a lot of stuff. And I think that sometimes in order to have faith, we have to be willing to step out and be a clean slate, not with a bunch of scribbles, Try to get the scribbles, not even with all the things that we like maybe or are familiar with, but maybe just step out and say, God, today I'm a clean slate for you and I have faith. So remember that about Abraham, father of faith. He's a man who lived his life with a clean slate. Let's pray together. Thank you for the story of Abraham, oh God, someone who loved you, someone whose life was a picture of faith, oftentimes going where he wasn't sure of and having to trust you, not only 
for the adventures, but even in the times of crisis and sadness. Help us to live our lives with a clean slate, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. As we start uh, this series, there's a, a song we're going to be singing. You're going to be hearing it, and I'm hoping that we'll be singing it as a hymn together. It's called Ancient Words, and um, it's a song that reminds us that the texts that we hold dear are ancient, but they're also still true and still new. So let's listen. Ancient Words. Come to us through sacrifice, O oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart, O oh, let the ancient words in Ancient words are true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart. Ancient words are true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Let the ancient words The scripture reading this morning is from the Hebrew scripture, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. You may find this in the Pew Bible if you want to read along on page 10. I'm reading from the New International Version. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will, make, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you 
and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. And I just discovered I don't have all the verses, so I need to find them. It's okay. <laughs> I want to tell you a story that I read in a book by a guy named Bruce Filer. And if you're looking for a book to introduce you to the first part of the Bible, I recommend this book very much. It's called Walking the Bible. His name again is Bruce Filer. It tells a story about an English archaeologist who had spent some of his career as a, an intelligence officer for the British, but uh, as his life progressed, became an archaeologist. And he was leading a dig in the ancient city of Ur. This is in the summer now of 1929. So his team was digging in this particular site when they came upon a, a layer in their excavation of silt. And they were able to identify this silt as coming from the Euphrates River. And so in the 1929 equivalent of Twitter, this archaeologist, Leonard, Leonard Woolley was his name, sent out a telegram. And when he sent the telegram out, he said this, we have found the flood. He was sure at that moment that they'd found physical evidence for the biblical story of the deluge. And so excited was he that as soon as they found it, he sent word out. Well, word came back to him from one of his colleagues saying, we find it hard to believe that you have found the flood. You are either crazy or you're right. Two weeks later, Leonard Woolley had to admit that what he found was the equivalent of a backyard flood. <laughs> it was not a deluge that, that there was evidence of for much more than a, a very small area. And so he had to step away from this great archaeological find, all the excitement that it had generated, and admit that we have not found the flood. The Bible is full of these events that are fantastic, that they're miraculous, they, they're inspiring, they make us, well, they're designed to make us want to believe. And as we read today, or as Carol Jean read for us, the Bible is also full of places Special places. Abram 
His story isn't very old before he starts building altars, and he builds altars to commemorate some event, something that happened to him, a promise made or an experience that he's had. But I think what I'm hoping that we can see is the most important part of the scripture are the, are the people, the people in them. And so I want us to spend a few moments as we start this series with Abram, who comes to be known as Abraham. This is the first character in the Bible that we can have some affinity for, I think. Other characters, they show up, Adam and Eve, they sort of show up, do their thing, disappear. Uh, their sons show up, do their thing, disappear. Noah disappears. We have the story of the Tower of Babel. We have a lot going on in the first 11 chapters. But when we get to Abram, now we stick with this guy for a number of chapters. And what I want to suggest is that Abram lives his life as a kind of blank slate with tremendous openness to what he doesn't know is going to happen. And I want to look at two adventures that I think... Uh, help us to see this. And the first is the one that we read today. God calls Abram, I want you to go to a place I'll show you. And Abram gets up and goes. Bible tells us he's 75 years old. I don't think it means for us to, to think necessarily that he's literally 75, but I think it does want us to think about the fact that he's not a kid. He's, this is not his first day at college, right? But speaking of the first day of college, for those of you who went maybe, or are going, maybe you remember that first day, that sense of, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. I'm out of the house. I'm on my own. Now I can have cookies. Seinfeld says, you know, since I became an adult, I've decided I can have cookies whenever I want. Parents were always saying, don't eat those cookies before dinner. They'll spoil your appetite. He says, well, my appetite keeps coming back, so I don't have to worry about spoiling it. First day out, Abram is, it's not his first day in college. He's got some years behind him, but, but still he's, he's living life as a kind of blank slate. What's going to happen? Where am I going? What an adventure. Jan and I were talking about this the other day and uh, reminiscing and remembering that one time she had a job that she was doing very well at, and she came home one day and she said, Mark, she said, I think they're going to make some changes. What would you think about me quitting my job if thus and such happens? Well, we were very fortunate uh, in that we had a roof over our heads, we had some stability, and I said, hey, you know, I'm okay with it, if, if you're okay with it. It was maybe two and a half or three weeks later. She came home. She said, I quit. I quit. Jan did what so many people have wanted to do. Go in and say on a, any particular day, I quit. Right? Of course, it's nice to know what you're going to do next. The, the uh, conventional wisdom is, before you quit your job, have another one lined up. Don't just quit. But in her situation, she had nothing. She came home. She said, I quit. And I said, what are you going to do now? She said, I don't know. I don't know. Nothing in the tube. Nothing lined up. And even those of us who love our work, I'm sure there have been times when we've wanted to say, that's it. I'm done. I quit. Except our better angel gets hold of us and says, what are you going to do for supper, you know? Like the little kid who runs away from home, gets two blocks away and realizes they're hungry and runs back home. What would it be like to live like that? To, to step out in the morning and to think, my gosh, this is, this is an adventure. And yeah, maybe I have plans, but maybe I want to be open to the things that, that I can't see, that I can't anticipate. What about for us as a church? What about saying, you know, we know how it's been, but it's a new day, and, and maybe this is an adventure. This is not for the faint of heart, is it? This is not easy to do. It's not always advisable. But that's how Abram lives his life. He, he, he's a blank slate. And listen to what God promises 
greatness. You'll be the father of a nation. You'll have a land. You'll have property. You'll have wealth. Well, okay, whatever, whatever road that is, let's go. I'm ready. I'm, I'm good to go. What an adventure that is. I remember watching as my parents drove away my first day of college, thinking to myself, where's the cafeteria? Where's the cafeteria? On my own, but not really. Very much dependent on other people who are going to take care of me there. Abram is a blank slate. And that's great for an adventure. You get in the car at the beginning of the day with a bunch of friends and say, let's just go. But I want to read another passage. Also from the book of Genesis, 10 chapters later. God called to Abraham and said to him, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. Well, this adventure has just gone south. It's amazing, this component. God sending him someplace as yet to be discovered gives him the general direction but says, you're not going to know when to stop until I tell you. And that's not only true for the location, that's true as we read later in this passage with the knife in hand. This is the first time, say many Bible scholars, when we are confronted with someone and we ask ourselves, what would I have done? What would I have done in that situation? Would I have been open? And the fact of the matter is that many of us, in fact, perhaps, perhaps all of us will face at some time or other in our lives a crisis where we realize we don't know the final destination. We don't know exactly where it will end or how. And we realize we're along for the ride. So it's not just the adventure where Abram is, is willing to live this life of faith, but it's also in the crisis. It's in, the, it's in the, the moments of despair and uncertainty. And, oh my gosh, volumes, reams and reams have been written about what brought this moment to pass. The Bible says this was a test. But if you read the story, God calls Abram, but it's not God who stops his hand. The Bible says an angel stopped his hand as he was about to slay his son. Who do you listen to? Who are you open to? When the moment of crisis strikes, when the uncertainty with regard to what to do, we might say to ourselves, well, we would never be in a situation where we would sacrifice a son. Don't tell me you've never done something foolish, with the hope that it would bring about some good, that you've never convinced yourself, if I do thus and such, then maybe that will turn this around, if I just believe. Taken to a place not of our choosing, stopped by the hand of an angel, are you willing for your life to be a blank slate or are you so determined to find the flood, to find what you want that you're unable to see what's really there? That's the challenge Abram presents us with. That's the hope. He's not known as a man who had great plans, whose script was all laid out for him and he understood it all. He's a man who lived by faith, and a man who trusted God. And the scripture says, in the adventure, 
in the joy and in the tragedy. That's why his name keeps coming up. Father Abraham. Because the truth of the matter is, whether you want to live that way or not, that's really how life is, isn't it? I mean, maybe 90% of your plans will happen just the way you want, but there's that 10% or even that 1%, that moment when you realize, I'm not in control and I'm going to have to trust. Let's pray that as individuals and as a community of faith, we will contemplate as we make our way through the scripture. This guy is apt to keep popping up this notion of faith. Let's contemplate what it means to be a people who live our lives with a slate blank and open to what God would want to write on it. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for Abram, Abraham, for those who loved him, for the wife who went with him and sometimes along the way challenged him, for the parents who let him go, for the servants who supported him, for those who cared about him, for those who were willing to let their lives be led by someone who didn't know exactly where he was going. Impress upon us this kind of faith, what it means to be this kind of person. And let us hold close to our hearts um, this ancient one, Abram, whose story continues to trouble the waters of our lives and to inspire us even today. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to give our gifts and our tithes, and as we do, I'm going to invite you to sing. Um, and this is the one that's in the bulletin, except I don't know where my bulletin went to, so what number is it? Storms of, when the storms of life are raging. I know the, the name of the hymn. Five, five one zero, five one two, bingo, five one two, yes. We'll sing the first two verses and as we do, we'll remain seated and give our gifts and our tithes. Kurt, can you give me a hand quickly? So I'll move it to the center. Okay. Thanks.
responses to the great thanksgiving will be printed on the screen before you. So let us pray together. My friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Almighty God, the story of creation is majestic and mysterious. Life is your gift to us, breathed into us by your spirit. You give us the choice to join our voices with all that is, the hosts of heaven and the creatures of earth, to sing your praise. With joy and faith we say together, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, Lord God, God of power, power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of our forebears, as Abraham stepped into the unknown with faith, so we come together in faith, willing to learn together what it means to love as Jesus loves, to forgive as Christ forgives, and to live into the vision of your reign among us. Help, Help us, us trust, trust you in all things. things. Willing to walk each day in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ. On the night that he was handed over, Jesus gathered with his friends to share the Passover together. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Whenever you do this, do it in memory of me. When supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks. Gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you do this, do it in memory of me. And so we remember and proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Give us faith that enables us to know Christ in the simple act of sharing the bread and cup with each other. And now, with faith in Christ and trusting in the presence of your Holy Spirit, we join our hearts and voices in prayer. Loving God, we come before you this day with things that have weighed on our hearts, with joys that lift us up, and so many of our experiences that lie in between. Especially this day, we lift up prayers of healing for Jennifer Swint's friend, Jenny Comerford, as she recuperates from surgery from lung cancer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. We pray for our friend Jim, for relief from extreme pain from a cracked disc. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are afflicted with multiple sclerosis and all those who are addicted to alcohol or drugs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we give thanks for the excellent report of somebody here, her sister's medical condition. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving God, we lift up all of these things in your name. And we pray that as you guide us forward, we would remember the words that you taught us to pray so long ago. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day, day our daily, daily bread, bread, and forgive, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine, thine is, is the kingdom, kingdom and the power, power and, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, the body and blood of Christ are broken and shed for each of us. Amen. I believe Rachel asked four of you to join her and help the Holy Communion. If you're one of those four, I'm going to invite you to come forward now. This is an open table. You don't need to be a member of this church or any particular denomination. Um, you don't necessarily have to have faith in the same quantity as Abram or Abraham had. Um, this is a place where we, we come with the hope and with the faith that God is with us in something that's so simple I was thinking about this this morning, how the church is so much like bread, how the ingredients are brought together and constituted. But um, it's not just pretty to look at, it has to be taken in. And with us too, uh, after we come together and commune together, we're sent into the world to, to love, to serve, to forgive, uh, to bear witness to the good news of Christ's presence. So you're invited to come, the ushers will uh, direct you to come. You can come down um, the aisle and Rachel will distribute the bread for you. Uh, you can dip it into the chalice or if you'd prefer to take one of the smaller cups, you can receive that way as well. You'll put the empty cups in the trays on either side and return to your seats by the side aisle. Let's come now and break bread together.
God, how can it be that these simple ancient words, do this in remembrance of me, continues to inspire people to come together, to gather in faith and hope, to um, plead for and accept forgiveness, not only from you, but from each other. How can it be that these simple words continue to constitute your church, to bring so many different people together? We're grateful for these words, for the faith they inspire in us, for the hope that they give us. May we embody these words as we head into the world. May we be sensitive when we encounter an Abraham, someone perhaps who doesn't quite know where they're going. Teach us to love, to be compassionate, and to remember the power that these ancient words can have in our lives today. And we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Some announcements. I know you have some announcements. Joy, is, do we have access to this microphone? I want you to go last, okay? I'm gonna save, not save you for last. Um, one announcement that Pam asked me to share, there's um, uh, staff parish relations is meeting this coming Wednesday at seven. I don't think that's in the bulletin and it should be. So there's that announcement. And Rachel, go. All right, I've got a few announcements. Um, uh, this com the next couple of weeks are really, really busy around here. Uh, everything gets started. Tuesday night, Ripple is getting started for our youth groups. Um, so anybody who's in uh, younger youth, our junior hires for at 5 o'clock on Tuesday, our high school students starting at 6.30 on Tuesday, both groups get fed. It's a wonderful time. On Sunday, there'll be a pool party for the Timothy Society, and so that kicks off. On the 25th of, um, of this month, a few Sundays from now, our college brunches will get started. So those are some of the uh, youth and young adult stuff that's happening. Um, Sunday school is going to get started next week. And the day before Sunday school starts, we're going to have trainings. Uh, Safe Sanctuary training is this Saturday at 10 a.m. And some Sunday school training around that. If you're still interested in being involved, let me know. Um, after that, there's a blessing of the animal service, which is going to start at 1130. If you've got furry or feathery or even slithery friends, you can bring them. We will bless them. I am doing it. I am not squeamish about slithery things. I'm a little squeamish about tarantulas. If you want to bring that, bring a, bring a picture. Um, but shy of that, bring in your... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'll even do tarantulas. <laughs> but uh, bring in your, your furry friends uh, for a wonderful blessing of the animal service next Saturday starting at 1130. On Sunday after worship, uh, well, during worship for our Sunday school, we'll get started um, blessing of the backpacks. So little ones, our, our children in school, bring your backpacks. Heck, our big ones, college students, want us to bless your backpacks, bring them in. We'll bless those too. Um, and then uh, after service next week, um, a bunch of us are going to go march in the Pride Parade to show that, that we stand for justice and love here, and, and everybody is welcome in our congregation. If you'd like to join us, come, and it's going to be a wonderful experience. Um, the last announcement I ha I'm uh, going to make, I made a little bit of it last week, this Thursday and Friday, I'm going to have my first experience at Provisional Academy. I go to this five times a year for three years toward my ordination. Um, if you can keep me in your prayers, I would love that. And um, we're going to be starting a worship service. As part of my ordination journey, I have to do a fruitfulness project. We're going to start an evening worship service. I'm hoping to get it started in October. If you're interested, let me know. I'd love to have you involved. But please keep all of this in prayer. It's an exciting time. Lots of good things going forward. Thank you. Tomorrow's Labor Day, so a lot of us aren't working, which always struck me as odd. Why would you call it Labor Day? Why would you call it Day Off Day? But anyway, so tomorrow evening, just to remind folks in the Bible study, there's not the Monday evening Bible study. Tomorrow night we'll start again. But there is um, a gathering on Tuesday, and this is where I've, uh, we would like Joy Paulson, a missionary from China, to speak with us briefly. Huh. The first time I stood in front of this congregation in this hall, I was a seventh or eighth grader. I was part of a youth service. It was my job to lead prayer. I got through the first part fine, and then I forgot the Lord's Prayer. and was so <laughs> grateful for someone behind me whose voice got us going. Um, Tuesday night, I'm not going to forget. Um, I'll be sharing my experience, my observations 
um, of what is the church like in China today. Um, you do get some information about the church in China, but what you hear today is sometimes dated and sometimes from one perspective. I'd like to share with you my perspective. So please come and join us 7 o'clock Tuesday night in the Reed Booth Room. Excellent. Thank you. Your story reminds me of a time that Pastor Bill Veen and I were doing a nursing home service. And B Bill was a pastor, and he had asked me to come along and play the piano. And th this service, I, I don't remember. I can't believe that we took up an offering. And I may have shared this story with you before. But anyway, Bill wanted us to sing the doxology, which I can play by heart and had sung, I don't know, maybe 4,000 times. So we start the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And then neither one of us could remember the next line. <laughs> I, I kept playing and he looked at me and we were kind of mumbling. Oh, oh. So he said, wait a minute, let's stop. Let's do this again. Okay, we started again. We started three times. We could not remember the words of the doxology. I mean, he wasn't that old and I wasn't that young. I, I don't, but boy, we just hit a block. And um, that, I've never forgotten that. And I was just so grateful that 90% of the congregation gathered there really didn't care. But anyway, <laughs> so that's something you know so well. It makes you wonder, you know, how well do you really know it? Okay. Well, Abram, Abraham and his family encountered storms, as do we. And as do many of the people we encounter in our own families, as we hear our prayer concerns week after week, there are storms in people's lives. Let's finish this hymn. Uh, what number was it, 512? 512. And let's sing verses 3, 4, and 5. loving God, stand by us through our ups and our downs, through the good and the bad, through the wonder of this world. Stand by us. And we beg, we pray. Friends, go now from this place. Be blessed by God who loves us so dearly. He calls us on adventures we'll never know until we step upon the path. In God's name we pray. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace with one another this day. Mm -hmm. 